Okay, thanks for having me. Um, it's often hard to talk about patents. Um, people find IP in general sort of boring. Um, it's something that prevents researchers often from being able to publish. Um, um, but what I hope to convince you is that patenting does have its place in commer commercializing your innovation and uh, seeing results in the clinic, often in order to um, to translate your, your research into the clinic, um, you need patents. And the reason you need patents is because in order to get investment dollars, um, investors, they want to make sure that they have a monopoly for a, a certain uh, time period. So it's, it's next to impossible to see positive results in the clinic unless you do have patents. So even though some people may view patents as sort of being an evil, I think in the end, um, they do result in social good. And that's part of the reason why I've got into this industry in the first place, is because I do believe that by patenting your innovation, it can result in um, promoting innovation in Canada, and it can also help patients in the long run. So just backing up a little bit, and for those of you um, who already know this, perhaps you can sleep for a couple of minutes while I go over it. It's the afternoon. Um, I'm sure you all want to, you know, get back to your lives. But so, what is a patent? Um, so, a patent is something that prevents. It's like a negative right, uh, right. It prevents others from making, using, and selling your invention for um, a period of time. So, it's typically 20 years. There's some caveats. Um, you can obtain uh, patent term extensions due to delays. Um, uh, due to regulatory approval, delays um, because of the patent office, but generally it's rule of thumb is 20 years. Um, so it's a technical document. So my parents who don't really know very much about patenting, they live out in the valley, um, they're both teachers. Their view of patenting is that it's something that you apply for, you write your address down, the title of the invention, that's it, you get like a certificate in the mail. And for copyright, that is the case, but for patents, it's not. It's a, um, you have to write up a very lengthy, technical document that describes your invention in a lot of detail and often in excruciating detail. So it's like a review article almost. Um, the most important part of a patent application is the claim section at the end. So for some of you who are familiar with patents, um, you'll recall that the claim section is a number of, of series, uh, like a series of sentences that uh, define the legal monopoly. And these are couched in uh, legal ease, are often difficult to understand. But in a nutshell, um, they just define the scope of your protection, what you can prevent others from making, using, and selling. And that's the most important part of the patent, because that's your legal protection. So what are the requirements for patentability? So let's just review these. Um, so in order to patent a technology, um, the technology has to be new or novel. And what this means is in a legal sense is that all features of the claims cannot be described in a single, um, what's called a prior art document. So in a single, single paper, a single pe uh, presentation, or anything that's part of the public domain, but it has to be a single piece of prior art. Um, your invention also has to be non-obvious. Now, I find that scientists often get tripped up on this because whenever they do things in the, in the research lab, they do it because it's obvious and it should work. But in order to actually patent an invention, it has to be non-obvious. So what, this, what does this mean in a legal sense? So what you do is you, it's a conceptual exercise, and you look at all the prior art, so all the, the knowledge that's gone before your invention, and you compare what's already known to what you've innovated. And then you compare what you've innovated to the prior art and ask yourself, or to a person skilled in the art, um, is that um, innovation not obvious or not? Things like increasing temperature, that's not something you can patent if it just increases the reaction rate in a predictable way. Um, your invention also has to have utility. And um, really all this means is that your invention has to have industrial applicability. And most of the, um, the research initiatives that you'll be working on will have utility, and it, this really never comes up during patent examination. Subject matter eligibility is an increasingly important um, area of the law that impacts nanomedicines. So your invention can't be a theory like E is equal to MC squared, Arrhenius theory, things that are not applied in just basic research. You can't patent that kind of thing. Um, you also can't, in, in some countries, patent living life forms. You can't patent humans, obviously. 
And the last requirement is that you have to show um, how to make and use your invention, and you also have to describe it in enough detail in your patent um, to meet what's called uh, written description requirements. That's a US requirement, but most countries have this requirement. Um, so you have to describe all the different embodiments and permutations of your invention to show that um, they're commensurate with the scope of the claims. And this is often why patents are, are quite long and lengthy. Um, so just backing up a, a bit, I just I wanted to provide an environmental scan or just uh, put forward some of the problems and uh, the challenges of securing patent rights, particularly in the nanomedicines context. Um, so there's a really challenging backdrop here. Um, there's very low allowance rates. So what I mean by allowance rate is you file your patent application at the patent office. It's very similar to, or it has some similarities um, to a review process for a manuscript, like a journal article. A patent examiner examines your patent application. They look at the claims and they determine whether or not it meets um, novelty, non-obviousness requirements, written description requirements. and when they feel that um, your patent meets those requirements, and often takes some negotiation back and forth, back and forth with the patent office, um, often amending the claims, those are the claims at the end of the document, to narrow them in scope, then you get an issued patent. And this can take a number of years. So those allowance rates in, this, in nanomedicines, and I'll show some slides later on, are very low. Um, there's also um, an increasingly, nanomedicines is, is an increasingly crowded art. There's a lot of um, uh, prior knowledge in this area and that makes it very challenging to secure uh, patent rights. Also, um, to make it even more challenging, the courts, the Supreme Court in, in the US has not been very patent friendly in the last 10 years and I'll show a little bit of case law um, to support this point later on. So what are the practical implications of all these challenges? This can translate into really hot, uh, high costs for securing patent rights. And I'll show you some, an example of a very complex um, examination of a patent later on in some of the slides. Um, it's very expensive to, um, also to uh, patent in multiple jurisdictions and multiple countries. And there's challenges with subject matter eligibility requirements. I'll go through each of these points uh, and drill down in the next slide, slides. Um, so this is a firm, Kenobi Martins, that I partner with in San Diego, and they're fairly active in this area. They collected some stats um, on allowance rates. So the overall USP, so USPTO is the US Patent and Trademark Office, and the overall allowance rate is fairly high at 67%. So this is the, um, the rate at which you went from when you file your patent application to when you issue whether or not you have a success rate. So 67% of the time, you file a patent application, it issues. Um, that's not the case for LMP. It's very low. It's actually 30%. And for um, silencing RNA, I was told it's even lower. It's, it's 19%. So these, this information was actually published um, at a TIDES conference in San Diego um, in, in May of this year. So it's fairly recent information. Um, as I was saying, um, LMP prior art is, is very busy. As you can see from this graph, um, I'm going to go through these quite quickly just because of time constraints, but this is liposomes of surface modification, things like PEG, I suppose, and complexation. Um, and so what the, um, happens at the patent office is the patent examiners classify subject matter into particular categories, and they use these categories to search for prior art. So this is a category um, of liposomes of surface modification and complexation. And this graph just shows the year and the number of issued patents. As you can see, um, it's progressively increasing. There's some ups and downs, but the trend is, is, is certainly upward. So it's becoming a more crowded art all the time. Um, here's another art unit of uh, liposomes. Uh, so again, it's, this is showing um, an upward trend in the number of patent issues per, patents issued per year. Uh, nucleic acid therapy um, is really high. There is a total of 1,630 hits between the years of 2011 and 2018. It's a very growing, high growth area. And for um, diagnostics, also another really high growth area. Now keep in mind these numbers may not be that accurate. I have a proviso here, like sort of a disclaimer, you know, pa patent examiners uh, categorize patents incorrectly all the time, but it, it shows the general trends. And it, um, the point is that there's a challenge in securing patent rights in this area just because it's increasingly becoming a crowded art. 
Um, I just wanted to give you some context. So this, shli this uh, slide shows um, patent categories just for non-emerging areas. Dentistry, I just picked these off the top of my head. 23 hits between um, 2011, 2018, curtain drapery, 16 hits. So that's, that's a lot lower than the, the last slide showing, you know, over 2,000. So it's a high growth area. Um, as I mentioned to uh, briefly before, there's been um, negative developments in the case law. Um, so this is U.S. case law. The reason I pick U.S. case law is because the U.S. Is, is the most important jurisdiction in which to secure patent rights, obviously because of market size. And they also, it's important to keep a um, abreast of patent law in the U.S. because it sets the tone for other countries. Um, so there was an important case in 2017. It wasn't in the non-predictable arts like in nanomedicines. It was um, f it was actually for a brake uh, system, and the invention was just automating it. So it really was an obvious invention, it, and it was a me uh, keep in mind it was also um, a mechanical art. So the patent was invalidated for obviousness. And what what's the reason why I bring up this court case is because since this case, it has been more difficult to argue obviousness before the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, the lower courts uh, were, were saying that in order to arrive at a finding of obviousness, um, separate prior art documents, when combined for a combination invention, had to show some kind of motivation, and, and actually an express motivation to combine the prior art documents. So that meant that it was much more difficult previously to arrive at a finding of obviousness. Supreme Court said that that test is um, too rigid and market forces can often um, motivate a person of skilled in the art to combine documents and arrive at the invention and a finding of obviousness. And the practical reality of this, even though this invention really was obvious and it's a mechanical invention, is that it's given examiners at the patent office just more tools, a sort of open you know, a can of worms in terms of the number of arguments that they can present during the examination process and use against you. So that's the KSR case again. Um, I just wanted to show an example um, of difficult examination before the patent office. Um, so this is just a patent that I, I selected from the diagnostic field. Um, it relates to um, collecting samples. Um, from your cheek um, by a swabbing method, determine expression level, levels of, of particular uh, D, of DNA, like within the genome from the sample, and using um, analysis to uh, develop a correlation to colorectal cancer. Um, so this patent eventually did issue, and this also depicts shows. Um, how a lot of perseverance um, can, can result in patent issuance, but it also shows that it can be challenging and cost a lot of money as well. So this is just a snapshot of one year of the documents that went back and forth with the, with the patent office. And a lot of this is very procedural stuff, but each time a document is filed at the patent office, you have to have your patent lawyer submit it, and that costs money. So this, this just shows, like, you know, there's, what, like 20 documents. It's probably... $5,000 worth of work, and this adds up over time, and this the patent application was undergoing examination for 10 years, so you can imagine the cost involved. Um, so here's just a summary of, um, of the prosecution or examination of this particular patent application. They had one restriction requirement, that's where the patent examiner comes back and says um, that the claims define more than one invention, so you have to narrow your claims down to one invention, so they got one of those, they got four uh, non-final rejections, and I have some estimates here of how much I would, like the typical cost for um, responding to four non-final rejections, four final rejections, and then they had to eventually appeal it um, to the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, and I would expect that would cost 20K, maybe even more. So, you know, difficult prosecution. This is not the case for all patent applications, but um, you never know. You can get a difficult examiner, and this can happen, so you should be aware of um, of this possible risk and the money involved. Um, another th challenge is coming up with the money for filing patent applications. So a patent is only good in the country in which it, was, it is filed and then issued. Um, so here's some examples of costs of typical places where you would fi um, file a pharmaceutical or nanomedicines type invention. So in the US, you'd always file there. You're looking at between four and five K. 
Um, Canada is a lot. It's actually a lot cheaper, twelve hundred, maybe even less, maybe a thousand. Depends. You should probably be getting two or three quotes for these um, filings. In Europe, you're looking at almost ten k. It really is that much. It's amazing. But Europe covers a bundle of countries. It's not just one or two countries. So it's every industrialized country essentially in Europe. So it is, you're getting bang for buck for Europe, but it's still it's very expensive. Um, China, more people are filing in China now just because of um, the population. Um, but the cost is high because you need translations. So you're looking at almost 10K there. Japan, again, you need translations, 7K. Brazil, um, between 4 and 5K. India is cheaper because you can actually file in English. You don't need a translation. But there's challenges in, uh, in enforcing your patent in India. And then Australia is pretty good value for money. It's comparable to Canada. So the grand total is around 40K. That's just for, that's, this is just the initial filing costs. And then you have costs for prosecuting your patent application in each of these countries. Um, this is a very busy slide. I think the take home message here, as I alluded to earlier, is that not everything is patentable. So um, this has a genomic swing to it, um, but in the diagnostic field, um, you can't get a patent issued for just a bare correlation. There's been a lot of developments in the case law in this area. Um, there's a recent court case, though, that said as soon as you add um, in the claims uh, like a technical step to um, treating the disease that's being diagnosed, then that turns it into uh, patentable subject matter. Um, for biological sequences, um, you can't just patent uh, nucleic acid protein sequences that exist in nature. And that might seem, seem obvious to you, but for many years, people were actually patenting sequences that had counterparts in nature, and that was put to a stop. I'll, I'll discuss that in the next slide. But you can patent cDNA because that's man-made and uh, naturally occurring sequences with genetic modifications. Um, you might be surprised to hear that you can actually patent life forms um, in the US, not Canada. So you, you can patent knockout um, mice um, you can patent bacteria, viruses, living life forms, as long as they don't have a natural counterpart in, uh, in nature or markedly, are, are markedly different. And um, medical treatments are not patentable in Canada. They are in the U.S., um, but there are ways of getting around it in Canada just by casting the claims as use claims in Canada. Um, so these are some of the uh, Supreme Court decisions on subject matter eligibility um, that raise challenges. So Bilski's seminal case, it has to do with um, patenting business methods. People were actually patenting business methods. This is around hedging. Um, that was considered not patentable. Um, so Mayo versus Prometheus, this was a case involving injection of a of a therapeutic and then uh, measuring this rate of, metab of metabolism in the blood. If it was metabolized um, slowly, then you would dose at a subsequent time um, in order to take into consideration the, the metabolism rate in the blood. And it was considered just a law of nature. What is, I think, a little bit confusing is that often these things boil down to how the claims are crafted. So in Mayo versus Prometheus, it was really just about, okay, you, you give this drug, you, you, um, you monitor its metabolism, and then you adjust dose accordingly. But it was, it was cast as a hypothetical, not as a series of concrete method steps. And so that's really why the, the patent was invalidated. And I think it really highlights how important it is to get the claims right and to be aware of this case law. Um, myriad um, related to uh, products of nature. So this was the BRCA gene. Pe um, so there was a patent that claimed just the BRCA gene. It was for its application in diagnostics, but it actually claimed the composition of matter, exactly how, uh, how it existed in nature, in people's bodies, essentially. So that was considered not patentable. But the, this particular case does have a glimmer of hope because it, it expressly stated that cDNA is patentable. And then Alice um, is, is more applicable to um, high, the high-tech industry, so I'll just uh, gloss over it. Um, so this is just the male versus Prometheus. I went, already went over it because it was an invention that just related to exploiting a natural law. It didn't have 
process steps, it was not considered patentable. It was just exploiting like a fundamental principle um, of nature. Uh, again, myriad genetics, even though you can't patent natural counterparts, you can patent a cDNA, you can patent um, natural sequences that are modified. So it wasn't a complete exclusion, exclusion of all biological material. So what do all these challenges mean to a mid to um, small startup? You know, patenting is very expensive. Um, there's a lot of case law you have to navigate through. Um, nanomedicines is a very busy art. Um, it just means that you just have to be a lot more determined. You have to work with your patent agent closely or patent lawyer closely and ask lots of questions throughout the process. And keep in mind that often circumvent circumventing these legal challenges just boils down to getting the claim language right. So it's really important to make sure that you have a good patent lawyer who understands um, the backdrop, the challenges in, the, in this particular um, field and knows how to claim draft well. Um, data requirements is something that people often ask me about. Um, so how much data do I need in order to file a patent application? And I never usually have a clear answer, unfortunately, because it really depends on the nature of the invention. So in my practice, I see a lot of independent inventors, often um, who haven't even been to college, just have a grade 12 education. And for a simple mechanical invention, you actually don't need any data. Um, a lot of patents are filed for, I'll give you an example, um, you know, like the sleeves that you put around your coffee cup. There's probably hundreds of patents on that, just different designs and, um, regarding like uh, how to keep the coffee from, from burning your hand and the designs actually facilitate that. And there's hundreds of patents in that area and they don't have data. Um, something like a new cloning vector might be kind of in the middle. Um, particularly if the DNA sequences are already known in the prior art, you would need less data for something like, like that compared to a complete new class of drugs um, where you would need a lot of data. So here's the legal test for determining whether or not um, you have enough data. So it has to do with the breadth of the claims. So if the claims are really broad, you're going to need a lot more data to enable them. Um, the nature of the invention, as I mentioned before, mechanical invention, you might not need as much data as a biotech invention. Of course, there's always exceptions. There was a recent case in Canada for helicopter landing gear where they had put uh, simulation data in their patent application, obtained issuance. It was later invalidated because that simulation data um, was not considered sufficient to enable the claims. So it really depends on, on the backdrop and what's already known in the yard and whether or not you can make a prediction regarding the scope of the claims and the subject matter that's covered. Um, so state of the art, does the literature describe known ways of preparing components of, of your invention? Um, so how far is the prior art developed in the common knowledge? And the level of ordinary skill in the art, a person who has a high skill level in the art, um, would be able to enable an invention much more easily than someone in, like in a mechanical field with maybe just a grade 12 education. Um, again, the level of predictability in the art. So bio biotech is very unpredictable. Um, so you're gonna need more data to bolster um, the scope of your claims in the biotech arena. Um, also, the reason why I have um, highlighted in red some of these um, factors is because they're actually under your control. So some of these things are obviously aren't under your control. You can't control you know, the, the common general, general knowledge in the nanomedicines field, but you can actually control the amount of direction that you provide in the patent application. So you really need to flesh out the different embodiments of your invention. Existence of working examples, again, you have control over that. You can prepare data to provide enablement across the full scope of the claims. Um, just to also highlight that this is a fairly complex analysis, um, there was a case in 2005. It related to a claimed segment of, of DNA, um, so two, sorry, two segments of DNA that encoded a fusion protein, um, one for an antigen binding domain um, of a single chain antibody and, and a receptor for lymph lymphocytes for use in cancer immunotherapy. And there was absolutely no sequence information provided for um, the DNA sequences at all. But these DNA sequences were already known in the art. The patent was not invalidated for lack of enablement, surprisingly, even though it's in the unpredictable arts. 
Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, there was a case in 2019. This was an important case because there was a split in the case law regarding written description enablement, whether or not a written description in the U.S. is a separate requirement from enablement. Um, and so they heard this decision on bank. So that was to clear up some of the misconceptions regarding whether or not there was a separate written description requirement or, or not required under U.S. patent law. Um, so the, the panel of judges in the Federal Circuit came back and said, um, there is a separate written description requirement. This is a requirement to show possession of your invention. Again, it's under control of the patent agent or lawyer who's writing your case. You have to show different embodiments, permutations of your invention to show that it, it's enabled and that you're in possession of the full scope of the claims. And so they said that, that there is that requirement above and beyond just showing how to make and use your invention. And so this invention related to NF. Uh, Kappa F it is a, as probably many of you know, it is a protein that binds to DNA and re releases cytokines. And so the the claims were drafted extremely broadly. They were method claims, um, but they covered like all compounds that would have the effect of binding to um, NF Kappa F and um, reducing its binding to DNA, thereby re uh, reducing the amount of cytokines that are released in the body. And so the court came back and said the patent's invalidated, there's not sufficient data, you've only just really set out a research project. So this is the other end of the spectrum where it was found that there wasn't sufficient data to uh, meet the written description requirements. Um, another reason why you might present data um, apart from meeting enablement and written description requirements um, is to show that your invention is superior to what's in the art. And I always encourage inventors to include this kind of information in their patent applications right at the outset because it can be really helpful in trying to convince an examiner down the road that your invention um, has, has technical merit and is superior to what's known in the art. So you'll get a rejection um, based on what's already known in the art, saying that it's, it's obvious, it just, it's, it's essentially pro forma, it just it happens. And then you can come back and point to examples in your patent application that show um, that your invention is superior to what's already known in the prior art. And so this is, this is great to point to and it can really um, streamline patent examination. Um, so one topic I also wanted to touch on is freedom to operate. This is really important because um, if someone wants to part your, partner with you, uh, venture capitalists are interested in giving you money, they want to make sure that you're not infringing other people's pat patents. Um, so this can really uh, represent a significant risk to uh, gaining market entry. And you should have uh, FTO clearance well before you start commercializing your invention or asking um, for money from venture capitalists. So what does it mean to have freedom to operate? It means that what you're, um, so when you infringe, it means that what you're doing falls within the scope of the claims of the patent. And the way you do the analysis is you start with the independent claims. So the independent claims are the claims that stand alone. Independent claims are claims, numbered claims that depend from independent claims. So you start with the independent claims. So here's an example. So. This is extremely simplified, but say a claim co uh, covers a liposome comprising. Now, comprising is open language. It means um, including but not limited to um, phosphatidylcholine, DSP, PEG, and mitoxantrone. And say your liposome um, has phosphatidylcholine, DSP, PEG, but it doesn't have mitoxantrone, and mitoxantrone is a requirement of the claim. Well, there would be no infringement. But say um, your liposome has all those components. It has DSPC PEG, it has DSPC mitoxantrones, um, but say it has additional elements. Well, that actually doesn't matter whether it has additional elements because the word comprising is, op is open language. It means including but not limited to. So you would still, you would actually infringe um, in this particular instance, despite the fact that you are in possession of additional elements. Um, whenever I do FTO analyses for, for clients, um, you know, you often find stuff that patents that are really re uh, relevant in your searches. But the first thing I do um, for an issue patent or an application is to check whether or not it's abandoned because you can't infringe an abandoned patent. 
Um, there are backstops. Pa uh, patent applications can be reinstated, and issued patents can also be reinstated. So I check to see whether or not um, we've gone beyond the, the reinstatement deadline. And most of this information is actually available on eSpaceNet. So that's a prior art database that's available just um, uh, like to anyone on, it's not a pay for use database, it's just available on uh, search, uh, just on Google. So just Google eSpaceNet and uh, you'll be able to download um, the database. And you can ch uh, check online, it's called the dossier. You just click on dossier and it, and it provides the status of, of the patent rights. Um, so how do you handle patent applications that pose an infringement uh, risk? So say the patent application is, is um, not abandoned and the claims are ridiculously broad. And this happens all the time. Like what people do is they file really broad patent applications with claims that cover, you know, everything, just a liposome generally, like any formulation is, is quite ridiculous often. Um, so how do you deal with that? Because when you do your FTO analysis, if you do do it in-house, you'll come back with all sorts of hits. And most of them, though, are patent applications, meaning that they haven't issued yet. So what I've done in practice, um, I worked for a biofuel company for, for 10 years. We had a big portfolio of, of about 300 patents and applications. And it was our um, partner, Shell, um, wanted to make sure that we had freedom to operate. And so I made up a database and, and reviewed patent applications and patents also with scientists. It was an ongoing process. And if there was a problematic patent application with claims that we knew were ridiculously broad, we knew that it, um, the technology had been described in the prior art, we found prior art that would knock out the claims and keep that on file. Um, so getting a patent isn't the only way um, to protect IP. There's other ways of protecting intellectual property. Um, there's copyrights, trademarks, industrial design, and also uh, trade secrets. So I think what's most relevant um, for this talk is, is trade secrets. Um, you might uh, produce works of copyright, or you might also get trademarks as well. That's not really my area of expertise. Industrial design comes up um, to cover the design of a product, just the aesthetic features, not the functionality. Um, so these alternate forms do not actually protect the functional aspects of an invention, although a trade secret can. So how do you protect a trade secret? Um, so tr a trade secret is actually a subset of confidential information. Um, and this is, this is defined by common law. So it's only known by a small number of people. Um, the, possess the possessor must demonstrate he or she acted with intent to keep the information secret. So in a, from a practical perspective, this involves just marking um, your documents as confidential. Um, it must be capable of industrial commercial applications. So it must have some kind of industrial utility and the possessor must have an economic interest worthy of protection. Um, but there are some practical limitations with trade secrets. As soon as your employee leaves, you know, there goes your trade secrets along with them. Um, but on the other hand, you know, patents don't necessarily protect um, all aspects of a given technology. When I worked for a biofuel company, a lot of uh, the value actually in um, the company was tied up in their uh, pilot plant and this involved uh, know-how graphs, operating the plant, improving throughput. Um, this is just stuff that the technical people knew and was in binders and databases and things. Um, and cumulatively this information was probably just as important as the patent portfolio in that particular context. I do think for startups patents are very important because you haven't developed that know-how yet. Um, but as your company grows, patents actually do become, to a certain extent, less important as, as know-how. And especially in a, like a biofuel context where I worked, where they had a plant and they were going to license it to other, other companies. Um, so the take-home point really here is to always make sure to protect your trade secrets, mark them as confidential, have policies in place when uh, employees exit the company to make sure that they're not walking off with your trade secrets. Okay, so I think I just went through that. And you know, this has its own expense. It's not really a dollar amount, like paying an external patent agent or, or lawyer to file a patent application, but it is a bit of a drain on resources. So keep that in mind as well. 
Um, another way to uh, protect your intellectual property in a very roundabout way is defensive publications. And this essentially is a strategy involving protecting your rights just by putting your inf the information out in the public domain so that others cannot patent it. Now this can be a little bit of a risky endeavor, but in some contexts it actually does have value. So the pros are, um, it's inexpensive of course, um, and it can reduce FTO risk. So a Gillette defense is just, um, it's a legal defense where you're showing that if you just do something that's in the prior art, something that you described in a paper 10 years ago, something described in an earlier filed patent application that you filed, then it gives you a defense from infringing a patent at a later date. Um, the cons are you still might infringe other patents and it, pre and it can preempt you from securing your own uh, patent rights at a later date when, you know, oops, I've decided I really want to patent this, but now it's out in the public domain. Um, so you might actually consider this um, for some of your more low value um, inventions or, or, or borderline inventions where it's not really clear whether or not the invention is patentable. So it would arise in those particular contexts. Um, I did a talk uh, about six months ago at the University of Ottawa for a third year um, to third year law students um, around cannabis law because our, our firm has a cannabis law group. And uh, one thing I presented on it was this really interesting um, initiative to put as much in the public domain ar around um, cannabis strains so, th so that large companies can't come in and, and patent different strains of cannabis. And this, this is an, an initiative um, of SMEs, so small to medium enterprises, because they just wanted to have freedom to operate. So here's an example of what the database looks like, and there's a, over a thousand entries. It shows the chemical composition of different strains of cannabis. So I thought that was interesting. It's a concerted effort to maintain freedom to operate by putting information out in the public domain. So what are some IP considerations when starting out on your own or collaborating? So I think I have about five minutes, so I'll just go through this, this briefly. Um, so when you're setting up your own company, you should obviously have clauses in your employment agreements assigning rights to your company. Now in most countries, including Canada, um, there's something called hired to invent. So if you hire some, someone who's supposed to be inventing for you, um, then the intellectual property automatically vests with the company in most cases. Um, collaborations can get really messy. Um, the biofuel company I worked with, there were shell employees. We partnered with another company called Codexis in Northern California. <clears throat> and um, there's often fights over IP and who came up with the intellectual property rights first. And the best way for sorting all of this out at an early stage is to keep really good laboratory notebooks. Um, now, I, there's some camps who say that it's not worth it just um, because in the US it used to be first to invent. So it used to be imperative to keep good lab notebooks because um, the priority dates um, that you achieve for your invention had to do with the, uh, the actual invention date. Well, that changed in 2012 under um, American Invents Act, so the U.S. is now first to file. But still, like if, if, you're, if you're collaborating or you plan on collaborating in the future, you should keep really good lab notebooks so that you can sort out ownership at a later date. I'm also making sure inventorship is correct. The start is really, really important. Um, I often deal with cases for clients where a patent application is filed in a couple employees' name. They leave off a, per a person who, um, who, ha who con uh, made a contribution to the claims. He should have been named as an inventor. Years pass, say the employee who was left off um, gets let go, joins another company, and then years down the road when the invention starts to make money, guess who comes out of the woodwork? <laughs> it's the inventor who was left off. And in many cases, that inventor, and I've seen this actually happen in my own practice, um, the inventor will talk to your competitor, and then your competitor um, will be able to assert co-ownership if the inventor um, assigns rights to that company. So it's a way of your competitor gaining access to your IP, and you'd be surprised at how often this actually happens years down the road. So always remember to keep good good lab notebooks, not to not keep um, people off um, in, as an inventor of, of patent applications when they should be left on. So that determination is really important to do at the outset to um, reduce a lot of headaches down the road. 
Um, so just in conclusion, I know I've sort of pointed out a lot of the challenges. Um, I think people should remain positive. I'm kind of a glass half full kind of person. I think if you understand the fundamentals of patents, there's a lot of, um, of really good resources out there um, just on the internet. If you just Google IP watchdog, uh, patent Leo, they're great resources of case law um, to help you understand written description enablement, novelty, non-obviousness, keep abreast of case law, and, and always um, make sure to work closely with your, with your patent professional, whether it's a person at um, the tech transfer office or if it's an external patent lawyer, ask a lot of questions and make sure that you've got the scope of the claims correct. Um, so hopefully that'll keep costs manageable. If you're engaged in the process, you'll also be able to leverage your IP to the greatest extent possible. And also I want to, I, I really liked Ewan's talk where he talked about, you know, you have to remain positive, sell yourself, be really determined. I mean, IP is, is very difficult to get a patent, but it can be done. As you saw in the, in the earlier slides, it took 10 years for one company to get a patent issued, but they got it issued. Um, you have to be adaptable. Um, um, and startups really have a lot of advantages. I mean, they have a young workforce, they're hardworking, they're adaptable, they're, they're usually very innovative, and they have high energy and just leverage that. Um, to your advantage. And so I'll leave you with this final quote. Next to invention is the power of interpreting invention. So I'm a lucky one who gets to interpret an invention. It's kind of the, net, the, the second best thing to actually coming up with the inventions yourself. So I'm, a, I'm a really in a lucky position to be able to provide um, you know, value to companies, hopefully, in, in commercializing their inventions. So if you have any questions, you can email me here at this email address. And of course, my firm wants a little disclaimer at the end. but. Um, <laughs> That concludes my talk. Thanks, Diana. Um, so thanks, Wendy, for that talk on patents as well. I'm going to skip over um, really talking about patents and rather come at it from an institutional perspective. So um, I'm with the industry liaison office at UBC, so I'm going to try to tailor this towards other technology transfer offices, but obviously a lot of what I'm talking about relates to the policies of uh, UBC, and so your technology transfer office may have um, different policies or may do things in a different way. So just be aware of that uh, as I go through this. So the kind of main aspects of what um, technology transfer offices do and how can we uh, help be involved or how do, we, how do we relate to these aspects of IP um, licensing um, so one of the aspects is sponsored research. So when a contract uh, comes in or money comes in that's to be sponsored at the university, uh, that goes through the office. And so, for example, with this network, there are agreements in the background that define um, what happens with that funding. And one of the things with the network, for example, is related to commercialization and notifications of, of commercialization and inventions, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, the other thing is discoveries that have a commercial potential. So for example, at UBC, if there is something that you want to commercialize, you would come to the office to talk about um, how to commercialize that and what you have, um, whether it's patentable, whether there are other aspects to that software. Uh, there are other, Wendy went into other ways that one would protect this, but in general, something that had the ability to be commercialized, that's something that our office can go through. Entrepreneurship opportunities. So the other aspect to this is, you know, one one way to look at it is you have an invention, uh, you can license this to a company that's existing, or you may have more of an interest in becoming an entrepreneur, starting a company yourself. And you heard a lot about that this morning in terms of uh, startup companies. And and one of the aspects that Marcel also spoke to is uh, something related to e at UBC entrepreneurship at UBC, where there are resources available uh, for essentially that company to go through, look at their market, look at their product, try to understand uh, what that opportunity is before really going forward and starting that company necessarily. And then the last aspect, which is really the aspect that I uh, am centrally involved in, has to do with IP transfer. And, and there's some components of this that have to do with research tools and moving materials around. Uh, but the bigger component is doing that licensing and, and ultimately uh, patenting and protecting the technologies and then doing licenses either to existing companies or to um, startups and putting those licenses in place. And so you heard some conversation this morning, you know, in the, in the hard knocks uh, discussions about, and then the technology was shelved, for example. Uh, and, and so 
you know, our office has, it's coming on probably 40 years worth of experience in licensing. And a lot of what we do is based on what has happened in the past, um, issues that have come up. And so there are, there are clauses in the licenses that ensure that technologies will come back uh, to the university if someone's not developing them. And these are, are things that are very important to the university. Uh, just as you've heard today, you know, you don't want this technology to sit on the shelf, you want it to be developed. Uh, one of the things that also came up was, you know, someone asked about, well, is it better to have something assigned or is it better to have it licensed? Um, when you look at something being assigned, one of the concerns is, is exactly that. If you assign it, there is no control. A, a technology can't return um, to the institution. And so these are all things that are considered when we're doing these agreements. Um, and they're also considered in the context of, you know, what is the technology? Um, is there going to be continued research going on at the institution? So if there is going to be continued research, that has to be something that is taken into account in terms of uh, not just taking one patent as it is and moving that into uh, a company and just saying, you know, uh, that's it, we're, we're, we're done with that, but really thinking more in the context of a relationship between that company and the institution and continued uh, research. So, uh, you know, some of the other uh, aspects there that have to do with the licensing get into... Um, I'm just trying to see if there's any other ones here, sorry. Uh, yeah, so improvements, which I talked about, and that's, that's again, that context of if you're going to continue to work with the university, then you may want to structure a license that's um, more, more structured in the sense of uh, having further technologies come through and developed and being able to advance that company. That's something where usually that's uh, more of a startup company as opposed to um, what we would see with you know, out licensing to a company that, that already exists. So this is a little bit more about the, the policy. Again, if you're not from UBC, you may have a different policy, so I encourage you to look into the policy of your institution, uh, see what is required or what your obligations are. Uh, with UBC, with something that is funded by the network, it would be notifying UBC of an, an invention or you know, I call it an invention, but essentially it's something that, as we've talked about over the time, over the few days here, you know, when you think that something has gotten to a point where you see that there's something there that has the potential to be commercialized. And that's, that's what we're talking about. The earlier, the better to start talking about these things um, so that everyone gets an idea of, of what is going on. And also so that your technology transfer office can help you out with some of these other aspects which I'll get into, which have to do with, you know, looking at the prior art, like Wendy was talking about, um, doing those patent filings, having that discussion of the timing, having a discussion of um, where, how much data do you have, how much data do you need. So at that point, you're notifying your institution of something that you have that you think has commercial potential, and as well uh, notifying the network, and that's something where the institutions will work with Diana to, to uh, work through and just make sure everyone's notified and the obligations are met. Um, so for, for UBC, this relates to uh, faculty research, uh, lab-funded research, graduate student research. Uh, these are things that fall under what we call Policy 88, which is basically our policy that defines inventions, but you will have something similar at, at your institution as well. So then another aspect, which I think we kind of touched upon, um, well, Wendy touched on it, upon a little bit, but that sometimes people forget is, um, of course, you know, being an academic institution, we publish. And in publishing, um, that is one of the things that defines a timeline for patent filing with institutions that companies don't necessarily have to address or deal with. Um, obviously, there's different mechanisms where they may, they may choose to publish, but ultimately, they usually have more time in order to strengthen out their invention, get as much data as possible before uh, having something published. And so it's important to just keep in mind that anything that's gone out in the public domain, journal publications, um, if you go to a conference you present, if you put a poster up at a, a conference that you may even think is local, if there's other people there, that's going to be a public disclosure. Websites, if you put anything up on a website, um, that's also going to be a public disclosure. So all of those things just keep in mind um, 
they will impact your ability to patent. Uh, some conferences, like the Gordon Conference, they sign NDAs, uh, but there have been cases where those confidential agreements have not really been considered by the patent office uh, to be sufficient. So, you know, it's best if you are going to be talking about something or need to be talking about something, if you can, if you feel it has commercial potential and you haven't come and talked to anyone about it or, you know, keep that information private, call it compound one if you can, or, you know, something that just d takes away disclosing the entire invention um, that you have there. Um, so, for those cases, you can also submit manuscripts. Um, so the manuscript submissions are confidential, but the caveats to that are there are times where you submit them and they, the journal puts them up online. Um, so we have to be aware of that uh, because we do also like to play a bit with the timing and this is where uh, people say, you know, again, do I have enough data for my invention? How much more data do I need? The more data, the better, really, because you're enabling everything. It depends on the technology. Uh, but the more time we have to get you to collect that data, the better. So if, it's, if you're going to submit a manuscript and it's going to be eight months until it's accepted and it actually shows up online and publishes, that's eight months within which you can collect data and strengthen out your patent and, and file your patent a little bit closer to when your manuscript is going to publish as opposed to you know, filing it right when you submit. Um, but we need to manage that a little bit uh, closely. And then you do also have um, a year be between filing. We didn't really touch upon this, but usually what we'll do is file something called a provisional patent, and then a year later, this would then be converted into a PCT, which is a, really the first formal patent application. And within that year, you also have time to add data. Um, so it's, it's really a matter of, of lengthening out as much time as you have there to strengthen out your invention before uh, this is going to be in the public domain. And then this relates to, you know, what, what technology transfer offices can do. And you heard Wendy talking a bit about prior art searches, freedom to operate, trying to find out what your freedom to operate is. Um, and so you can do some of this yourselves. Uh, things like Google Patents is an amazing database to be able to do this. Uh, but the, patent, the technology transfer offices do also have databases that we pay for that can do analysis. You know, how many patents are there in the lipid nanoparticle space? How many lipid patents are there? Um, so we can use those resources to do a little bit more to determine the exact space that you're working in and what your freedom to operate might be, for example. Um, so just even if you're looking at, I'm going to make a lipid nanoparticle, you have to consider what lipid are you using? What other components are you using? What is your therapeutic? Um, and do any of those already have a patent that is based on that that you are not going to have access to or you are not going to be able to use? Uh, even for the lipid nanoparticles, there were patents around the exact structure. They've now expired uh, last year. But around the exact structure of a lipid particle that has this type of lipid around it and carries this type of nucleic acid in the center, right? Um, and so there wouldn't really be freedom to operate on commercializing that unless you were able to get a hold of those rights. So those are all things to consider, but ultimately those are things that you can work with the technology transfer office to have them help you look into and give you information on um, your freedom to operate or what other prior art is out there. And then same for patent filing, so then ultimately moving in towards patent filing, um, timing the drafting of the filing and also the continued prosecution. And so uh, Kaylee spoke to this a bit as well. There's, there's ongoing prosecution that the um, technology transfer offices do a lot of the time for startup companies initially. Um, and so we'll continue that management and then pass it off to the company once they've grown uh, and have someone who can actually take care of that because it does get to be, once your portfolio gets big, it, it really gets to be quite a big job. Um, so the other aspects, market review, this is again something um, that we've talked about a bit here as well, knowing what your product is, knowing who it is you want to target that product to. And there are databases you can go to, libraries uh, has quite a few, like EBC Library alone has, has quite a few. Um, but there are more in-depth ones, PitchBook was mentioned, uh, that we have access to as well, where, you know, we're able to look into that, do more of that 
that searching provide a better in-depth scenario of, of who the competitors are um, and, and who can be targeted. So the, um, you know, aspects of that in terms of just how that relates to your invention and how complicated your invention may be versus um, how, you know, something that's, something that's simple, something that's a new drug, maybe it's very easy to see where that might fit in. Something that has, um, is a lipid nanoparticle, it will be much more difficult to potentially understand how that's going to fit in, how that's going to compete. Um, and so some of these resources can help with that. And then the last one would be really understanding um, and meeting those obligations of the contracts that, that have been signed uh, with the network or um, even some of the other um, contracts that may be signed through, through um, other research funding. So. And I did want to make this, so this is kind of my last slide. I wanted to make a, or leave a bit of time so that we could have a bit of a discussion because I, I think there will be some questions on these aspects. So it, it is uh, already a complicated environment. It's a complicated legal environment. It's a complicated institutional policy environment and there's a lot of differentiation um, among the different institutions across the country because we don't have a national IP policy. Uh, in addition, it becomes even more complicated when you are a network of centers of excellence like we are because there's the NC network agreement, which um, Lindsay mentioned, you have to inform the university if there's an invention, uh, you know, disclose the invention to the institution. There's also a clause in that agreement, there was a link sent to all of you when you had to sign Annex A and Annex B to be eligible for your funding, that says within 30 days you have to simultaneously let the network know and the institution know. And then if you have multiple institutions on your project, that's compounded. So they all have to be notified and then the network or one of the institutions will call a meeting to discuss the IP. And as was mentioned, um, part of what the network will do is help to ensure due diligence on all the students that were uh, party to the invention, if any, and all the staff and all of the uh, researchers so that no one is left off because I think it was mentioned it's very high risk if you leave someone off and the invention starts, um, it gets protected and starts generating revenue, then people come out of the woodwork at the, at the most inopportune times sometimes. So um, there's other obligations under the NCE agreement and I think um, NCEs in general have a good working relationship with their institutions, but we need you in, um, as the inventors to um, let us know so that we can meet all our obligations under the NC agreement, the university policy, and um, keep this uh, opportunity moving forward for you because it is very complicated and Wendy has set out that it looks like our environment is quite busy. There's a lot of activity in our field. Um, so we're very, very fortunate to have Lindsay and Wendy uh, in the Enmin family writ large and uh, available to help and advise us. And each of you have those people at your institution and um, I know those offices are often very, very busy and off, uh, usually understaffed, but it's very helpful for the network to get engaged as well because it tends to get you off the bottom of the pile and up closer to the top in terms of the time and attention of the staff. So we'd be happy to open it up. I'm sure you have lots of questions. So who would like to kick off with the first question? Marcel. Uh, so the first one's actually for Wendy, but I'll do this as a uh, statement, and then if I'm incorrect, she can correct me. Um, so she talks, and it's more of a, a warning to anybody here that's trying to do intellectual property. Uh, you're going to receive challenges, and in my understanding of those challenges, they come from the patent examining office, yeah. and there are multiple patenting examining offices. So there's one in the U.S., there's the PCT, there's a Canadian one, there's European ones, there's China, it's just it's endless criticism. And then your patent actually issues, so that's awesome. But then you talked about all these legal cases. 
and it's, I, I do it as a standing joke, if your patent is successful and you hope your patent is going to be successful, it is going to be challenged. And that is a different thing. That's another company coming in and saying that you've, um, you're interfering with my patent or your patent is not as strong as it should be. Is that, is that correct? I have no other question. So the reason I talked about uh, the case law during my discussion of patent examination is because um, this is just a general principle of law. Um, so there's a patent act, and it sets out what's, what's patentable in fairly terse terms. Um, you know, your invention has to be novel, non-obvious, have industrial applicability. Um, it sets out the statutory categories of invention, and that's interpreted by case law. So the case law actually is what informs examiners how to examine your patent, how to interpret the Patent Act. Um, so that, I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your question. But then later on, um, you know, when, it, when your patent does issue and your invention becomes a huge commercial success, um, your, your formulation um, has gone through regulatory approval and, and you're making a lot of money, you know, your patent will be um, challenged. And um, in the pharmaceutical industry, there there's, a lot of case law um, where Big Pharma has filed patent applications, gained issuance, um, and the claims are very broad, and generics, in order to gain entry into the field, will challenge the patent. And that's actually where most of the case law um, comes from. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the take home points are patent examination, um, it should be informed by case law. Actually, it, it, it all, it, often it isn't, so the patent examiner is more tech, technically minded, but after a patent issues, becomes valuable, it will be challenged in the court. So everything sort of comes out in the wash in the end. I think that was my point to everybody. Uh, if you do this, you're going to be fighting these battles for a long time. Uh, and the other one is, it might be too specific, and again, you might be able to tell me just to, it's, it's something not to discuss. But in, in, the, in the example of technology being licensed and celebrating that, because that could be viewed as a, a success for NMEN, that we've licensed technology out to a company. And since I've been involved with a, a, a product that was licensed, and I would say that agreement did specify that that organization needed to continue work on it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't specific. It was basically demonstrate that you're doing something with this technology, and they came back and said, we're keeping up the cost of filing the patent. They did not do the IND. They did not do talk studies. They did not bring it to the clinic. Everything that needed to get done, they didn't do. So are, is the language that you're putting into these now more specific? So sometimes it is, but I mean, I would agree with you. It's the language is general, has been general in the sense of, you know, use best efforts. It, it, it's very hard to transact on that and get a technology back from that. Um, so there are other ways that we're doing that in terms of even having um, higher and higher fees every year so that uh, at that point the board looks at it and says, why are we paying all this money to this technology that we are not using? And that, that is one way I've found very effective to get technologies back because it does force it to be reviewed. Um, and then the other way would be specific requirements. You have to hit phase one by this date. You have to hit phase two by this date. Um, but it's still, it's still quite difficult in that sense to get it back. And then the other side of it is um, when you're negotiating that agreement, you're getting all this pushback from the company that you're negotiating it with that all of this is going to hinder their being able to move it forward, right? Because you will be able to pull it back if they don't hit that phase one at that time that you said. And I think Kaylee kind of alluded to that a bit when she said, you know, you put something in there that says, okay, I don't hit this point, you can pull the license back, then that starts to be a struggle. And so so we do often get pushback on that, and obviously from the institution's perspective, we, we find ways and to, to get around that, and one of those ways is, okay, well then, you're gonna have to pay more and more money, so you, at the end, review this if you're not moving it forward, because it's an important issue to the institutions. Well, I, I, I was gonna be quiet, but now I'm gonna continue on. Uh, with respect to that, all this takes time. So um, I, I'm concerned about when you say you can pull it back. Isn't that an, a you know, discussion, a legal discussion with the organization that you didn't meet these requirements, you need to sign off now, they're going to have their lawyers coming back and saying, no, we did meet this requirement. That can take years to go on. 
And yep. your product life is basically started from the time you file, and I always use this as an example, and I know you're familiar with this, the QLT-267 story, which was a technology that was patented out of the University of Toronto, and a drug was invented against that, and, and uh, lots of data was showing good support for therapeutic activity with that drug, but everything was just super slow. So 20 years later, you know, you start looking at it, well, can we develop a drug for this? The evidence was supporting it. We should have developed a drug using this, uh, but we didn't because the patent life was gonna expire in about two years. So the only option was sort of orphan drug status or some alternative means. Yep, and so, I mean, so. that's why you try to set up as reasonable a timeline as possible. You hit phase one after, you know, whatever it'll be, three years, five years. Now you're right, if they don't, then it does become a legal battle, right? Um, because they don't want to necessarily return it. Now, most cases, I would say, if they're actually not developing it, and I had that happen recently where they actually were not developing it. Um, and so when we went to them and said, okay, what's going on here? They re-reviewed everything and, and, and then did say, okay, we're not gonna go forward with this. So there's, there are you know, pain points for companies. They're paying for the patents. They're paying escalating fees every year, basically, to, to keep this if they're not actually using it. If the development takes a lot longer than it should have, th this is a very difficult one to get something back on because they're developing it, but there are aspects that they may hit that, that are complicated, right? They don't get their financing, doesn't the phase one doesn't go how they thought it would go. Um, yeah. I'm gonna, last question, I'll give you the microphone. Uh, does the inventor have any uh, say in what gets licensed? So if, again, as an example, I'll use the Arena 4C, the company that licensed that technology was a diagnostic company. They had yeah. never developed a drug before. They should have never taken this drug. But I don't yeah. think we had the right, as inventors, to go, this is not the right company. We do not, and, and, and I would say, I'll be specific here, BC Cancer uh, was paying costs. They needed to offset those costs. So that it was yeah. their, it was in their interest, not the inventor's interest, their interest to license that technology. So I'm just curious how much say the inventor has. So we do everything in conjunction with the inventors and, and basically do discuss with them, okay, well, you know, this is how we're planning to move this forward. Uh, tell them what we're putting in there. From our perspective as well, I mean, it doesn't make sense to, to license something into a company that's not going to move it forward or is not in the space. So those are questions we do ask. Are these, are these guys in the space of what we need them to be in, that they're gonna do this? If we you know, were to make a deal like that to see how it would work out, then I think there would be significantly stronger provisions for getting that technology back if, if, if it was to a company that um, really wasn't, we, we, we were unsure of how the development would go then that would raise concerns for us too. We would definitely discuss that with the investigators. Um, you know, if after a while you can't transact on something or get a license to happen, then you do need to drop the patents essentially, right? So those are your two choices. <laughs> you try to go forward with it and get somebody to pick it up or you have to stop paying for the patents. So um, that's usually the choice at the time with the investigator. And so sometimes they'll say, well, let's take a chance and see how it goes, right? Um, but I, I, in those cases, we would try to then look and say, are there ways to make this stronger and get this back a little bit easier? Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. We have a question at the back. Yep. Blair. Hi, Lindsay. Blair Levitt, UBC. Hi. Um, so I have a start with a general question, and, it's, and it may be a little bit UBC specific, but it's really around sort of the other approach that is possible as opposed to li uh, companies licensing. I don't know much about companies buying patents from uh, from inventors outright, and I don't know what UBC's policies are around that, how you determine what would be an appropriate value, and how often that actually occurs. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight into UBC's thoughts on outright sale of patents? Yeah, so basically I look at that as an assignment versus a license to something. Um, and so, you know, whenever you're assigning a technology, the, the cost is gonna be higher because essentially that assignment is, is you're now letting that technology go. You have no ability to get that back. You have no ability to continue research with it. Um, there are concerns also in terms of, of you know, assigning that and, 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 and 
losing that control, right? So that later, if it isn't developed, there really isn't anything the institution can do. Um, however, we do assign things. Um, usually when I have that discussion, especially I'm going to take it in the sense of a startup, um, the discussion with a startup, it's usually, it's, it, depending what type of IP or what type of technology as well, but if you've got something where it's a life sciences therapeutic and there's going to be a lot of development, developments are going to be done at the university, putting that assignment in place, and I think part of the understanding for that is, um, you know, when we assign a patent, we don't assign the patent and everything that comes with it and everything in the future and, um, you know, some great portfolio. It is that patent. That's it. it it's what's existing right there. Um, versus a license, which would be more of an interactive um, structure where really the company and the university are working together. There's continued work at the university. Um, so you can't, you know, if, if that's going to continue to happen and there's going to continue to be work and they need further assets, it just doesn't make sense to keep assigning that IP um, and, and, and or to assign an initial piece of IP. It also relates to the potential type of technology. Sometimes there are technologies where someone's developed something, it's um, very defined what it is, everyone's leaving UBC, it's something, you know, um, that's going to be separate and it's easier to kind of separate those two things. So those are some of the things we take into consideration when deciding between the two aspects. And, and as far as sort of determining the what's an appropriate cost, that seems like a Massive black box. <laughs> it is. I mean, how do you estimate what something's yeah, going to be worth? No, how I do mean, you? It really is. It's um, you know, what is the stage of the technology? What type of technology is it? Um, what development's been done already? How much has kind of gone into that at the university? It, it, all of those things um, vary quite a lot. And, and my my last question is a real practical one, and it may be premature to ask this if the agreements aren't in place, but I'm a UBC professor and now have, or will very soon have funding from NMIN. I certainly know my place with discoveries and the university. If it's research that's funded by NMIN, done at the university, can you give us at least the current thinking on how the IP is gonna work there? So the those agreements are stand, standard network agreements in the sense that the institutions will own the intellectual property. Um, and so there isn't, it's, it's, and Diana, you can kind of jump in here as well, but um, it isn't that the network would um, take that over or has any rights to commercialize that. So it's really that the institutions will commercialize that, but there'll be discussions with the network basically about how, you know, how can they help? Are there things they can bring into it? How, you know, how to uh, bring this forward, but there isn't an, it doesn't, it's not option to anyone else, it's not, uh, it's being retained by the institutions, depending who the institutions are. If there are other institutions involved, this of course then starts to add, you know, other potential inventors and institutions and discussions that need to happen. And, and this obligation to inform, that's presumably all confidential, it doesn't affect patentability issues like Absolutely that? Absolutely not, no. no. Yeah. Okay. Gilbert has a very short question, which requires a short, even shorter answer. <laughs> so um, my question is, because I've had this come up um, as an advisor to graduate students in a larger way, um, how, what defines if uh, somebody has made an inventive contribution and therefore should be named on a patent application? This is a social, this, this can become a social dynamic as people begin to construct one. And it's best to have that, I really would like to have that clear in people's minds before they start drafting documents and then saying, oh wait, does so-and-so belong on this thing? So what defines if somebody ha makes an inventive contribution? So I'm gonna just give you a snippet from UBC's perspective, but it's really better to have a patent agent kind of define that to you, but but ultimately, you know, yes, the, the, the concern is you know who the inventors are and that you define them correctly um, and that you have that conversation. And it's generally based on the, the claims and what, what inventive contribution they had to those claims, but there's some nuances to what's considered inventive, which I'll let Wendy address. Cause yeah, actually, no, that's exactly correct. So um, after you've drafted the patent application, you go through each claim, and if someone has contributed to the inventive concept of at least one claim, they should be named as an inventor. 
What, and so what makes them an inventor in that sense is there's, uh, there's sort of definitions you can find that are, um, you know, did you know what you were doing? So for example, a technician who took a sample, it was sample A, they ran it, um, there was some result, but they didn't know what the, the result was or what the sample was, wouldn't really be an inventor because they didn't know what was going on. So they, you have to kind of know what it is that you're doing and be the one to see at the end, oh, I see, aha, that, that was what came out of this or that's the novel aspect of this. And does it make a difference if it's an independent or dependent claim? It doesn't actually. So if someone contributes to a dependent claim, um, they still can be named as an inventor. But in practice, actually, you know, the inventive concept really is defined in the independent claims. So often the focus in practice is, but from a purely legal perspective, it is even a dependent claim. Because sometimes inventive subject matter is put in fallback positions in the dependent claims. You know, it just really depends on the facts of the case. Yeah. 